Hi everyone, welcome to today's meeting. Um, we're just going to wait um, for another minute um, to let everybody join. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jackie Morton and I've helped to organise this virtual meeting on behalf of the Royal Society of Chemistry's Atomic Spectroscopy Group. This is our second virtual meeting in this R uh, RSC GoTo webinar platform. Any errors made during the hosting of this meeting are solely down to me and for that I apologise profusely in advance. Today's meeting is entitled B is for Biomonitoring and we have three speakers, Robert Jones, Adam Laycock and Liz Lees. The format of the meeting will be that each presentation will run sequentially with the speaker one after the other and at the end we will collectively answer any questions. Please feel free to type any questions um, um, in the questions drop down um, aspect um, of where you've logged in. So in the go to meeting um, uh, um, login bit on the side there should be a a, a drop down menu that says questions and you can answer questions in there um, and if that doesn't work you can email me directly and I will try and field the questions to the um, speakers at the end. My email is Jackie, J-A-C-K-I-E dot Morton, M-O-R-T-O-N at H-S-E dot gov dot U-K. Um, and if you um, specify, if you want to specify any questions at the end um, to, a, a, to a speaker just put the Robert, Adam, Liz um, at the start of the question and then I'll be able to, to feel that. So the first speaker today is Dr. Robert Jones from the Centers of Disease Control in Atlanta in the US. Dr. Jones began his career at the CDC in 1993 and his current responsibilities include the planning, implementation, oversight and completion of programs related to public health that involves non-radioactive and radioactive elements or their isotopes. These programs involve research and development of a wide range of analytical methods to enable the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to assay and monitor the exposure of populations to toxic or essential elemental exposures and radionuclide contamination. These analytical methods include both total elemental analysis as well as the speciation of arsenic and mercury. Um, his responsibilities also include the implementation of laboratory aspects of multiple local, state, regional, national and international health studies or investigations. Dr. Jones will today talk to us about his experiences in research, which is entitled Public and Environmental Health Issues via Biomonitoring, Selected CDC Experiences and Future Directions. So we'll just move over to Robert and um, welcome him to the session. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Hi there, Robert. Me? I'm just waiting to see you. Okay, we're there. I'll let you, um, thank you very much for your talk today, and I will dip out and let you carry on. Well, good morning or good afternoon, um, wherever you are. Um, I appreciate um, the invitation to give a talk on biomonitoring. Um, it's one of my passions, and I've been working with biomonitoring for about almost 28 years now. So, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Everything is fine. Okay. So again, I'm the chief of the inorganic and radiation analytical toxicology branch within the National Center for Environmental Health at, at CDC. Um, our mission is to provide laboratory science and support for the detection of exposures um, as well as for the diagnosis, detection, and treatment, prevents disease and ill health. Um, and there's our website below. So our laboratory um, is in basically two large buildings. Um, we have about 400 employees within our division with 108 PhDs and seven MDs. And we have quite a number of advanced state-of-the-art analytical instruments to do this work. 
program areas include the National Biomonitoring Program, Emergency Response for Chemical and Radiation um, Incidents. We have a, a lot of work on tobacco and smoking addiction, looking at uh, tobacco products in people, um, actually in tobacco products as well. Newborn screening, uh, we don't do newborn screening, we develop the test and make sure that the papers used are appropriate. Uh, we do some nutrition analytes as well, and we have a little work on selected chronic diseases and selected infectious diseases. Um, we do respond to different um, epidemics um, and chemical exposures because we can measure um, over, four, over 500 environmental chemicals or radioglides in people. We look at different health effects. Um, we have about 60 to 70 uh, health effect studies a year, things like uh, bisphenol A, um, fire retardants, pesticides, and other chemicals in various studies. We also, um, one of our biggest projects is the uh, National Nutrition, and, um, the NHANES National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which from there we produced the national reports on human exposure to environmental chemicals. And the full report was in December of 2009. And the, we just update the tables about every year or two. The last one was just updated last month, all the different tables. Um, and that references at the very bottom, that link. So we have done the current in Haines for, since 1999, it's continuous. Um, each cycle is two years with approximately 9,000 people in each cycle. Um, so there's a lot of information. Uh, some examples I'll give you in a little bit, show you it's, it's very statistically robust um, for that information. Robert, sorry, can I just um, check that we've got sound? Some people are saying that they can't hear you. Um, I'm just trying to, I'm going to unmute you and come back in again. Okay. Okay, do you hear me better now? I can hear you, I'm not sure other people can. I'm just waiting for someone to tell me. Okay. Okay, hopefully those people who couldn't hear me before um, can hear me now. Um, some of the public health uses of this um, exposure report is measuring chemicals that actually get into people. It identifies various at-risk populations, which I'll give you examples of in a little bit. Um, it detects trends and exposure over time for the, for the U.S. population. Evaluates effectiveness of public health efforts. It's always good to have a way to evaluate any public health policies or other types of efforts. Um, sets priorities for public health effects research. So basically, um, you know, if you're doing public health, the, the cost of detecting exposures and disease of who, what, how much is thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the size of your investigation. Assessing the health risk um, could cost hundreds of thousands to millions. Uh, then you develop and apply an intervention, which could be many millions of dollars, and then assure public health intervention is effective. Um, again, it can cost many millions of dollars. But think about this. The lab components and the biomonitoring is the cheapest part of this whole process. The nice thing is um, we used to, many decades ago, um, only be able to use rat mouse data or primate data because the sample size that were needed to do these analysis were fairly large and people weren't willing to give large amounts of, uh, say, blood, uh, whole blood, serum, or plasma for these measurements. Uh, but because of the huge advances in technologies, we're able to do now things that we could never do before with much, much smaller sample sizes. So basically for biomonitoring, you detect disease or exposure. Now biomonitoring, these four um, applications, it doesn't matter whether you're detecting a chemical or an infectious disease. You detect the disease, um, you evaluate risk. That's the dose estimate estimation. That's pretty much the lab component. 
you apply an intervention. So you remove the people from exposure or you apply a medical countermeasure for an infectious disease. And then you evaluate uh, the intervention uh, by either laboratory analysis or a medical management follow-up. So biomonitoring is the assessment of an internal dose uh, by measuring the parent chemical or its metabolite product in human samples. It does integrate all sources and routes of exposure. So that's a little problematic sometimes for say the pesticides where one uh, metabolite could represent several parent compounds, but we do whatever we can do. It does, we do look at trace concentrations versus environmental levels. Many times the biologic samples, the concentrations are 100 to 1000 times lower than the environmental level. So it is a little bit more challenging and um, the amount of sample we can use is much smaller. So we do measure biomarker, biomarker concentrations, not actual exposures. To generate that, we have um, highly accurate sensitive methods. We sometimes have custom made standards. We work with the National Institutes of Standards and Technologies to develop standard reference materials as gold standards so that we have the best available uh, reference materials for uh, developing the methods, validating the methods, um, uh, and I'm going. We have uh, quality assessment schemes, either internal or we have a lot of external quality assessment schemes to ensure that our data is uh, correct. We have state-of-the-art instrumentation, uh, sensitivity and selectivity. We have good uh, facilities and there's a huge in emphasis on automation so that, again, things are done the same way day in and day out. Um, so you have minimal amount, minimal amount of input from different analysts, which you probably all know that you can get different results with different analysts. We have highly qualified staff. And again, we, we have a number of uh, quality assurance and quality control programs so that we can make sure you have great reproduce, reproducibility. Because today, we have to make sure our customers, the US public, the clinicians and everyone else, realize that there's no analytical bias from 1999 through today. Um, so maintaining that quality assurance, quality control is quite a challenge over 20 years. Um, but we have data to show that we can do that. So one, some of the issues with biomonitoring is the collection protocols. So external contamination is a huge deal, at least in the metals world. And it is also in some of the other uh, organic analytes because like metals are everywhere. They're in sample collection devices. Um, they can be in the biobanks or repositories. So one of the things that we do actually is we test every, um, not every tube, but every lot of like tubes, urine cups, butterflies, needles, everything to collect the sample and process the sample and to make sure it has low enough concentrations in the collection devices so that there's no bias for these national or any of our studies. Okay. Um, collection materials um, for medical devices, IVs and catheters, we've seen um, some very serious contaminations with that because we can't control those. Um, but we looked at um, the actual uh, IVs and catheters to find uh, certain contaminants in them. Um, uh, from the organic standpoint, you can have plastic materials that can leach from various tubings uh, that can offset your biomonitoring results. And antimicrobial preservative and preservatives and wipes or other supplies could have contaminants. So one has to be really th thoughtful about uh, when you're going down to very low levels, population levels, you really have to think about what is the potential contamination from your collection devices? So what public health officials actually are always needing an answer to is what are people exposed to or contaminated with? Who's been exposed and how much exposure or contamination did each person get? Because the decision to medically treat people obviously will depend on our ability to accurately identify and quantify um, internal contaminations. One of the huge challenges in this arena, especially in certain studies, and um, 
we've been involved in a lot of types of uh, emergency responses and what we call epidemiological aids where communities think they're exposed to certain uh, chemicals or metals. Um, so we go in and do a community assessment. So you have to sort out and try to find out who's truly exposed versus the unexposed. Because in a lot of studies, a lot of people may think they're exposed or contaminated. Um, so we have to sort out who's truly exposed to contaminated. We've had multiple cases where, say, communities around um, uh, waste dumps and waste sites uh, think their symptoms are coming from chemicals in the waste site. We go in, we do a community assessment, and we see that they're no different than the rest of the U.S. population. And we've had cases where people's symptoms have actually gone away because we've shown to them that they're no different, that their community assessment is no different than the rest of the U.S. population. So the laboratory has a huge impact on detect, diagnose, treat um, disease and exposures um, in various populations. And this has really impressed me a few years ago when I found out that 66 to 75 percent of current medical decisions are based on laboratory tests, not the uh, clinical assessment when you go to a physician or go in a hospital. It, the medical decision to treat is based on laboratory tests. That's why laboratory tests are so important and so important that we get it right. Now, some of the nice things about biomonitoring here in this national exposure report is we can look at different subpopulations, as I mentioned before. So you can look at the total population and get a geometric mean and you get the 50th through the 95th percentile. Actually, now we can we can go on out to 97.5 percentile. You can look at it at different age groups. Obviously, children are uh, considered you know, a susceptible group, um, especially when it comes to like things like blood lead. Um, then you can look at males versus females. Um, especially, we can narrow that down sometimes to uh, women of childbearing age and women not of childbearing age, and then different race and ethnicities. So it's very powerful in making public health decisions um, on what to do from a national policy. The other thing you can look at is trends in the data. So like in this example, you can look at the trends of an analyte in a population, say children, over time to see if your public health decision has had any impact. So like in this country, I'll mention a little bit, um, when they reduced the level of arsenic in drinking water that's allowed, we had data before that policy went into place, during the policy transition, and then after that. So we could actually monitor that policy decision over time. Now, we all know, and people forget about this, that everything is essentially a poison. It's just the dose, all right? You can actually die from drinking too much water. But the timing of the dose um, of the poison or contaminant is a factor. So one thing that biomonitoring can do is be able to see different stages of a person, whether it be prenatal, infant, child, teenager, adult, um, what their levels are. And I just showed you that in the NHANES survey, you can actually look at different subpopulations. Then the form of the dose or poison is a factor. So arsenic is, is one of the best examples where you have multiple forms of a toxic form of arsenic, and then you have essentially non-toxic form of arsenic coming from fish. I'll give you examples of that in a minute. So I know this may be a little bit gross for some people, but when I first showed up at CDC, this is how you got a sample for PCB and dioxin analysis, because the sample size required and the sensitivity of the instruments required to take a chunk of adipose tissue to do the analysis. Um, participation in these studies were sometimes a little bit rough um, to get people to agree to have a portion of their adipose tissue removed for these um, studies. Now we can do better, we can do more studies, we can do more analytes on four mils of serum or plasma than we could in several grams of adipose tissue in the past. So that's, that's given us huge uh, abilities 
over what we could do 30 years ago. So one big example is blood lead. So back in the 70s, CDC was considering lowering the blood lead levels, considering elevated for children from 40 to 30 micrograms per deciliter. Um, and a good laboratory method for public health uh, was established in 1972. A lot of research was underway looking at health effects. And the goal was to look at the prevalence of lead poisoning in the general population. Now, at that time, we, again, because of the limits of the technology, what they have done at that time for many, many years is they looked at air levels, water levels, soil levels, food levels, took in factors on nutrition, lifestyle, personal habits, et cetera, and put in as a very complicated mathematical model. And then they predicted what the levels of toxicants could be and then, then established public health policy based on this mathematical model, which is the best they could do at the time. But back in the mid 70s, um, the US started to uh, eliminate leaded gasoline. Uh, the EPA had a, had a uh, policy in place to try to, as quickly as possible, take the lead out of gasoline. Um, and when they were doing that, catalytic converters came on the site and it was starting to mess up catalytic converters. So there was a big push by the lead, the automobile industry and the lead industries to not force them to remove the lead in, in gasoline. And they were basing on the fact that the predicted blood lead with this drop in lead gasoline would only have a very small effect on the population based on that model. But at that time, we were doing this in Haines survey, um, large national survey, and included uh, blood lead. And if you see the plot here, this is what was happening to the US population um, on the average blood lead level in that population. So there was a significant drop in that, uh, correlated quite well with the removal of lead and gasoline. So it turns out, the EPA essentially overnight decided to accelerate the removal of lead from gasoline based on this one plot you see before you. So since then, the amount of leaded gasoline has dropped um, incredibly low. There's very, there's only one or two sources of leaded fuel still being used today, and the blood leads have dropped um, as well. You can see here, there's been other things in the U.S. Um, where you took lead out of gasoline, you took lead out of uh, lead paint in homes, you took lead out of the plumbing, or you prohibited use of lead plumbing, uh, lead solder. Um, they banned lead in solder in food cans, lead dust hazards. So you can see that the average blood lead level in the US um, has continued to drop um, asymptotically over the years. And that's also um, because of some of these changes, the, the people who are more toxicologists have changed their level of concern for childhood blood lead from 60, back in the 1960, the concern was 60 micrograms per deciliter. Now today, that would put a child in a hospital and put them on chelation instantaneously. In, four, in uh, 70, it dropped to 40, 75, 30, uh, 1985, it dropped to 25. In 1991, it dropped to 10. Now, when it dropped to 10, some technologies like erythrocyte portoporphyrin test were no longer uh, valid for determining if a lead. So a blood lead test was the only way to go to determine if a child was truly exposed. In 2012, uh, the level of concern or the reference value actually is five micrograms per deciliter. And it's proposed to drop that now to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter based on the NHANES 97.5 percentile of the latest surveys of NHANES to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter. But that's proposed, it's not um, definite yet. But the result of all these changes, you can see in the seven, late 70s, 88% of children in the United States had blood lead levels above 10. By the time you get to 2000, 
2000s, it's 1.6%. Now it's lower than that. So huge, huge public health success based on biomonitoring data that led to public health policy. And you can see, again, um, the drop in blood lead levels. The other nice thing is the change in technology. So there were several technology changes from um, flame uh, AA to graphite furnace AA, anodic stripping voltometry, um, and now ICP mass spec. One of the huge advantages of ICP mass spec is that you can look at multiple metals. So now, say in our laboratory, we not only look for blood lead, but we also look at mercury, cadmium, selenium, and manganese, and we're thinking about adding arsenic and uranium as a screening tool. Because of geologic um, spotty contamination in our country, just in the soil and uh, drinking water from private wells. Now, the way you can apply these, these biomonitoring uh, techniques to certain studies is we were asked to um, evaluate a really rare cancer cluster investigation in Nevada in a city called Fallon, where they had 16 cases of this leukemia um, in young children. The average rate um, in Nevada was 2.4, but in this county, in this city, it was 14.6. So this is a huge blip. Um, so they wanted to find out what was causing this cancer cluster investigation. Unfortunately, there was several theories. Um, arsenic was one of them because um, the drinking water uh, in that county was the highest level of arsenic in drinking water in the country. Um, uranium is a possibility. Um, ionizing radiation because of the military had a very large um, um, radio communications uh, spot there. Anybody who's seen the Top Gun movie, uh, they actually moved that Top Gun facility to this county. So there was a tremendous amount of jet fuel that was being used. And this is a huge agricultural community. And there was a, a phenomenal amount of pesticides that have been used over the years. There was a genetic possibility and infectious disease possibility. So we, in our division, came up with an, the idea of measuring 138 different chemicals that might uh, have caused this leukemia. So we wanted to look at the potential exposures, assess the prevalence of infectious exposures, and store samples for future analysis. So we looked at uh, cases, both parents and siblings are included, and environmental samples were evaluated from past and present residences. We had four controls to every um, case. Siblings were not included, um, and one in four had past residences sampled. So we looked at urine, blood, serum, and buccal cells for the biologic samples. Um, we had 18 metals or species, 31 non-persistent pesticides, 11 persistent pesticides, and those were chosen from what was prevalently used in, in the uh, community, in agriculture. 12 VOCs, again, because of the jet fuel, 35 PCB congeners, six retro and DNA viruses, and we stored samples for genetic studies. So we collected three tubes of blood, which went into 16 vials, and you can see what we measured from there. Then we collected a urine sample that went into 18, eight vials in one bottle for metals and uh, non persistent pesticides. So you can see we only had 21 mils of blood and 32 mils of urine to work with on average. Now, you know, if you work in the environmental world, you can get liters of water, you can get kilograms of soil, you can get kilograms of food, but in especially childhood investigations in our country, we pretty much limit the maximum amount of blood you can take is 21 mils. Um, but there are issues with even that. So this is the aliquoting scheme. Now this took us months to figure this out because we had to figure out what was the most relevant analytes we thought that could cause this leukemias. And then, we said, okay, if you collect a tube of blood, what would you analyze first? So we did whole bloods, then you would spin it down, then plasma for all these different agents, and then collect the white blood cells. The 
VOC tube was the second tube, so we, nothing was done with it except measure the VOCs. And then the third tube, um, again, was uh, spun down and used for various analytes. Now, one thing that made this so complex is you had to think about what was what was the most likely analytes to cause this, because if you're collecting blood uh, from a child or even a person in general, if the vein collapsed after the first or second tube, you don't get to the third tube. So you won't be able to get data from those analytes. So you have to really think about how you're planning your investigation and what analytes and how much is the minimum amount you need. If you notice, most of those aliquots are in the microliter range. So you really have to think about what you need to analyze, how much you need to analyze, and what is the order in which you analyze. Even for urine, you have to remember that a lot of times in especially small children, you don't get a lot of urine um, when you collect urine from children. So you got to keep the needed amount of urine uh, small as well. So what did we find? So we found arsenic in the vial biologic samples because obviously we figured that because it had the highest level of arsenic in the drinking water in the U.S. country, in the country. What we didn't plan on is we found tungsten at high levels um, and we detected that in the water samples. Now at the time, EPA didn't even require measuring tungsten in drinking water. And it turns out this has some of the highest tungsten levels in the country in drinking water. Part of it, I guess, is a result of the fact that this is a valley where water flows into it, but no water flows out. It just simply evaporates. So all these metals have been um, accumulating in this valley for millions of years, and tungsten is one of them. They actually had 16 tungsten mines in this community at one time. So here's a plot of, if you look at the U.S. mean, um, is way down at the bottom. The Churchill mean is about the middle of the plot. Not a whole lot of difference between cases and comparisons, um, but it was very interesting to tell the population that your, your levels were about 20 times higher than the reference levels. Obviously, we detected it in water samples, and um, it actually changed. They were building a water purification system for the community at the time this was going on, so they actually had to remodel the water purification system to make sure that they took the tungsten out of the water as well as the arsenic. So what does that new mean? Well, we didn't know as much as we thought about tungsten and arsenic, especially tungsten. Um, at the time, it was very challenging to tell the community, you have the highest levels we've ever measured of tungsten in people, but we have no idea what that means because there were no human health studies for evaluating tungsten in people. Now, they had we had evaluated from an occupational point of view tungsten co compounds, but not tungsten itself. Um, so that actually led to uh, adding tungsten to the national priority contaminant uh, list by follow-up studies for the National Toxicology Program. Um, and they conducted genetic studies to evaluate differential reactions to tungsten exposures. Arsenic is another biggie. Um, you have toxic species of, tongue, of arsenic in water, you have metabolites of those um, that the body tries to detoxify. You have essentially non-toxic species in fish, and you have various toxicity levels in food, depending on what kind of food. And then you have the industrial uh, species or types. Um, the EPA drinking water standard uh, was, was modified or lowered in 2006 uh, from 50 parts per billion to 10 parts per billion. So we actually had NHANES data going along here from 2003 to 2004 as far as not only just total, but we had speciated arsenic, then the compliance process where um, water purification systems had to lower that, and then we have the post-regulation time as well to look at the, the uh, change in the effect of that policy. So um, we realized, uh, back in the early 2000s, late 1900s, 1990s, that we really needed a speciated arsenic because we couldn't tell communities whether they're affected by toxic forms of arsenic or essentially non-toxic forms of arsenic. So we developed this um, 
HPLC ICP mass spec method to be able to differentiate the different types of arsenic species because if you have a community that lives close to the ocean and there are a lot of um, uh, fishing done there um, and the community eats a lot of fresh fish but at the same time their water sources may be contaminated and that's true in the northeastern United States um, we need to be able to tell the community whether their sources of arsenic are uh, from which form of arsenic it is now in the old days we just asked did you eat arsenic in the last I mean did you eat fish in the last four days and most people can remember I can't remember what I ate two days ago much less three or four days ago um, and then we found out a few years ago that turns out that the chicken feed industry was putting fish meal in certain types of chicken food feed so that even though you ate chicken you were getting some of the um, non-toxic forms of arsenic in the chicken mercury is another biggie so you got all forms of mercury essentially toxic so you got fish uh, mercury which is the methyl mercury you got dental amalgams you got industrial emissions, vaccine preservatives, which have essentially been eliminated, at least in this country, um, industrial uses. And we found out in the early parts of NHANES that 5.7% of the U.S. females of childbearing age had levels that exceeded the EPA reference dose of 5.8. So we needed to have a, because at that time, all we were doing was total arsenic. So we needed a, I mean, mercury. So we needed a mercury speciation method. So we developed, again, a um, HPLC, now it's a GC, ICP mass spec method to look at the different forms, at least three different forms of uh, mercury to determine whether their exposures are inorganic, methyl, or ethyl. Another um, case we worked on was um, the World Trade Center looking at um, participants, uh, firefighters who worked on that and found that um, because of antimony, which is used as a fire retardant in all types of uh, furniture and everything, carpets, that those firefighters were had a slightly higher levels of antimony than uh, other firefighters that weren't on the response or control firefighters and then you can look at and see the adult in Haynes so that's one thing now that led to people who thought that antimony that is used as a fire retardant in the firefighters clothing uh, could lead to certain uh, diseases um, and for a while there was a lot of stuff going on um, social media saying that firefighters should not be wearing um, antimony laced firefighting um, equipment because of the potential for exposure. So we actually did a study where we looked at two fire departments, um, one that were wearing the antimony laced fire um, protection in their clothing and one that uh, was not wearing the antimony laced um, clothing. And you can see there, there's essentially not a statistical difference between the two fire departments. Not only that, because of where they're located and probably their drinking water and, and diets, they were actually below the geometric mean of the general population. Okay, so that fortunately, we then had a communications program to try to let all the fire departments know that it's it's okay to wear clothing that is laced with antimony to protect the firefighters from their clothing catching on fire during a response to a firefighting. So public health investigations, biomonitoring can have uh, quite a diverse uh, impacts on various organizations. So other uh, public health uh, impact examples are, you know, the reduction in unleaded gasoline, which has led worldwide. Most countries, not all, but most countries have eliminated uh, leaded gasoline, fish consumption, uh, public health advisories where they look at the amount of methylmercury in fish in various um, lakes and issue uh, fish advisories in these different lakes. BPA, uh, free consumer products. I remember I was backpacking many years ago and when all of a sudden the um, 
BPA free products started coming out, the uh, water bottles, the only version you could find was a green water bottle because that's all the plastics industry had at the time uh, that was BPA free. Now, probably every water bottle you pick up um, has, it says BPA free. Salt iodine and consumer salt, that's a big deal uh, across the world um, because of the lack of iodine in populations. Arsenic in water is worldwide, that's very geology dependent. We've worked on biomonitoring studies in Peru and Mexico, lead uses in Russia, we've done huge biomonitoring studies there, lead uses in Egypt, it's quite an interesting story, and lead uses in Micronesia that we found um, just by happenstance, uh, looking actually at a nutritional study, we were doing lead measurements on the side. That's a whole nother talk in itself. All those are individual talks. So in summary, we, we always need to know more about environmental exposures. We need to know more about human health effects of the environmental chemicals. Public health uh, laboratories can provide decision makers with effective, high quality data. And we collaborate with epidemiologists, environmental engineers, public health personnel, and many others in our various investigations. So the, the future is uh, for chemicals with limited health risk information, public health policy, we need to understand the true extent of the perceived problem, because sometimes the problem is perceived, as we found, but it's not really a problem. We don't want to create a solution to a non-existent problem, but we don't want to miss a problem that has a very effective solution. And we've done that over years, looking at various communities and the community saying, we're, we're affected by some chemical and we go in and do a, a assessment and we find out if there really is a problem or if there's not a problem. They acknowledge that this was, um, you know, help from the whole branch, CDC, public health departments, federal partners, state partners, university research centers, non-government organizations, and international partners. It's all a big um, a collaboration between these different groups. So I'll end it there and let the next speaker go, and we'll be open for questions later in the meeting. Thank you, Robert, um, for a really, really interesting talk. Um, I can already see we've got some questions, but we'll come back to you at the end of the session with the questions. Um, okay. Guys, I can only apologise for the lack of sound at the start of the um, of the presentations. Um, I know Robert has said his talk might be available later. Um, people can contact me if they would like um, to see the, the first few slides, if you missed hearing the slides at the start. Um, hopefully there's not any sound issues now. Um, we're going to move on to our second speaker. Um, next, let me just work things out. Okay, so our second speaker today um, is is Dr. Adam Laycock, um, an analytical chemist from the Toxicology Department, Centre of Radiation, Chemical and Environmental Hazards at Public Health England in the UK. Adam did his PhD and then postdoc at Imperial College London with a further postdoc at the University of Vienna. Adam's work is focused on metal analysis and nanoparticle characterization in biological and environmental samples supporting research activities relating to human health. Adam's current topics of research include lead, um, blood lead levels and isotopic fingerprinting, um, development of um, OECD guidance document determination of metal nanoparticles in biological tissues, inhalation and translocation of uh, titriated particles, metal nanoparticle inhalation, air quality and e-cigarettes. I'm going to pass to Adam to start his talk. Hi, uh, Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. Right, so I think you should be able to see my screen now. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Jackie. So, yeah, I'm going to be presenting this work on lead isotope um, fingerprinting of environmental samples to link with uh, populations of children with uh, high uh, blood lead levels in Georgia. And this was a collaboration done with uh, the British Geological Survey and the Georgian Centre for Disease Control. 
So Robert already gave quite a good introduction to lead. So uh, five miles. Uh, so <clears throat> so um, this fits quite nicely. Hopefully I don't repeat too much. So yeah, lead toxicity has been for quite a long time now linked to um, impaired cognitive development. And uh, these graphs on the right hand side of the, my slide there are just one example of a fairly recent study which showed the blood lead levels of children at the age of 11, um, which were revisited at the age of 38. And it shows a correlation between the blood lead level uh, measured at the age of 11 and the development of their IQ and the change in socioeconomic status. So this is just one study that kind of shows, shows these trends. <clears throat> um, so yeah, as Robert mentioned, children are a group at greatest risk, and that's because they're still uh, developing a lot, um, but their bodies are also more effective at, at absorbing lead, and they can be more susceptible to exposures of lead because they might put things in their mouth they shouldn't, uh, such as leaded paint, which can actually have um, a sweet taste, could, so it can be quite um, quite moorish for a child, I suppose, in some circumstances. Uh, so uh, lead poisoning is typically identified by uh, measurements of the blood lead levels. Um, and in, um, in, in blood, the half-life of lead is around 30 days. Uh, it's slightly longer in soft tissues of a, of a few months, um, but in bones and teeth, it's on the scale of years to decades. And although there's no safe level of lead, um, as Robert mentioned previously, the, the, the blood lead action level for, ch well, for children, I think it's for, for adults, adults as well, is it's currently set at five um, micrograms per deciliter. Um, so to give you a bit of background, yeah, so this is just introducing Georgia. So Georgia obviously borders with, with Russia. It's um, got a, a, a it's also uh, on the on the Black Sea, and it has southern borders with Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Uh, so in this study, um, so Georgia split into several regions. Um, I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to pronounce them, but um, the the, the um, regions that are um, identified in different colours here are the regions that were included in, in, uh, in this work. And I'll be using this kind of color coded system later to present some of the data. Um, so a bit of a background on um, blood lead level surveys of children in Georgia. Um, so uh, following a, a dramatic increase in the number of reports of uh, lead poisoning and lead contamination, uh, the Georgian Center for Disease Control, in collaboration with the U.S. Center for Disease Control, uh, performed a survey at their major children's hospital in 2015, and they found that a third of the children at the hospital had um, levels of lead above the action level of five micrograms per deciliter. Um, the Georgian Center for Disease Control uh, also did a, um, a study, a survey of more rural areas. Um, and they found similar levels, uh, similar proportions of, student, of uh, participants above the action level. And when they went and uh, had a, a follow-up survey in 2017 and 18 of the same participants, they found that this proportion had increased. Um, so as part of the uh, National Multiple Indicator Cluster Survey, uh, which was a UNICEF-funded survey that looked at a lot of aspects, uh, they looked at uh, child blood lead levels and this was done in collaboration with the Italian um, Institute of Health. And this was the first national survey of just over one and a half thousand uh, participants. And there they identified that 41% of uh, participants, um, that children aged uh, two in between two and seven uh, had blood lead levels over, um, over five micrograms per deciliter. So in response to this, um, the Georgian Centre for Disease Control uh, sent out an intervention uh, just in the form of a letter to basically um, communicate the results of the lead levels um, and also advise on how um, on potential sources of, of lead and how um, uh, parents could take actions to reduce the levels of lead in, in children. So in 2019, um, there was another national survey, um, part funded by the um, National Institute of Health Research, which also uh, part funded this, this work. And they took uh, 423 participants, but from, 
from this group that had previously been identified as elevate, as having elevated blood lead levels. Um, and they found that um, only 19% of the participants still had uh, lead levels above the action level. So it seems this um, the intervention of, uh, of just sending out a letter, raising awareness and educating really had quite a, a big impact. Um, so this kind of, um, this is our study now in the end, so this kind of came a little bit later. Um, and this, we only looked at 36 households here, but instead of just looking at the blood lead levels, we also, also took some environmental samples. And we also looked at the isotope composition of the lead, uh, not just the uh, concentrations. Um, so, looking at potential sources of lead in children in existing literature, uh, there are a few potential sources. So, the New York uh, Health Department has previously identified high levels of lead in Georgian expats living in New York, and they also found high levels of lead in Georgian spices. Um, a couple of surveys, um, uh, soil surveys um, in, in Georgia, found that. Um, lead levels were elevated in some areas and are found to be increasing uh, in some locations also. Uh, the Georgian National Food Agency has identified um, some dairy and spice products as being above lead uh, limit values. Um, and there's also um, some toys that have been um, sold in Georgia uh, have also been found to contain high levels of lead. And the International Pollutants Elimination Network identified that some paints uh, still being sold and used in Georgia had high levels of lead, and that was in uh, fairly recently in 2018. So uh, the study was designed um, to try and incorporate some of these potential sources. sources. So as well as blood, uh, we took uh, samples of spices, teas, flour, milk, and water, and that kind of reflects uh, that would reflect a, a dietary uh, exposure. Uh, household dust samples were taken, which would uh, give an indication of inhalation exposure, and um, samples of soil paint and toys were also taken, uh, which could potentially uh, be other sources of lead in children. In addition to this, there was a questionnaire designed um, to gain some information about um, just how much exposure these children were getting to these samples. Um, and as I mentioned, these participants were recruited from individuals that were previously identified as having elevated blood lead levels from the multi-cluster survey. So following the sampling campaign, um, uh, the samples were sent to ourselves um, and uh, to BGS. So BGS received the soil dust and some of the tea samples. Uh, these samples were basically um, analyzed by ICPMS for lead concentration and the isotope composition. And that's kind of, the, that's the stage we're at now. So I'm going to be presenting some of the data that we've got from these samples. Um, and we're just in the next steps now um, of uh, performing some data analysis, modeling, statistical testing on, on the data and bringing in together the information of the concentration, the isotope information, and the information gained from the questionnaire to try and put together um, a whole picture. Um, so to go over the blood um, lead level results first. So this top graph here is from the uh, mix um, uh, survey that was done. So um, the percentages are the proportion of participants from those regions where the blood lead levels were above the action level. And I've highlighted uh, regions in uh, green, yellow, and uh, sorry, green, orange, and red there. And you can see that the kind of the distribution of um, a proportion of children with um, uh, elevated blood lead levels is not uniform across Georgia, but it's actually higher in the West, um, which is, is quite interesting. Um, and then the uh, graph on the bottom there are the blood lead level results from, um, from participants in this study. So you can see that they're all below, now below the five microgram per deciliter um, action level. Uh, so the intervention that was sent out seems to have uh, really uh, seems to have been successful in these participants. Um, we don't really see this trend going from east to west, but um, it's a low number of participants that we have here. So um, looking at some of the concentration data that we had from um, 
from, from some of the samples. I, I'm just showing some of the key samples here. The, so the flour, milk, water, and toys, uh, we didn't really saw low levels of, of lead or uh, levels below detection in, some, in, in a lot of cases. Uh, so if we look at the uh, tea and, and soil samples first, that these are, are plotted these on a, a, a linear scale. You see there's not much variation between samples um, and the levels are quite low. Uh, you, there are a couple of soils here that look, that seem to be um, relatively high, but if we consider that the EPA safety limit uh, for soil in a child's play area is 400 milligrams per kilogram, we're, we're still well below that. Um, so uh, on the on the right hand side of the slide here, we have the concentrations for the spices, dust, and paint samples. So the spices are quite interesting. They vary uh, over. And, and these are all plotted on, on a log scale. So the spices vary from as little as um, around 10 ppb all the way up to almost percent levels of lead in some of these spices. And we see some of the highest levels in some uh, some of the Georgian spice mixes, uh, some saffron samples, and blue fenugreek. Um, so the household dust uh, again varies over several orders of magnitude. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> this is um, plotted in, in micrograms of lead per meter square sample. So uh, the same area was always sampled every time, and obviously some areas of uh, will, some areas accumulate more dust than others. So um, you've got to take that into consideration. Um, that might partly explain why we see such variability. If an area has had long, a longer amount of time to accumulate dust, then we're likely to see higher lead levels there. Um, and the paint samples, um, again, plotted on a log scale. Um, so we have about half of those, uh, half of those paint samples below uh, uh, 10 ppm, and the other half are essentially above 100 and into thousands of ppm. So showing that there's probably that's indicating a, a split between uh, leaded and unleaded paint being used. So that's the concentration. Uh, uh, a summary of the concentration data that we, we have for these samples. So then we were interested in looking at the isotope compositions to try and look at the isotope signatures and link the isotope signature of the blood to the uh, possible environmental sources. So lead has four stable isotopes, uh, 204, 206, 207, 208 lead. 204 lead is the minor isotope of lead and it's the only isotope that isn't a um, decay product of um, or a radi radiogenic decay product. Uh, 206, 207, and 208 lead all are decay products of either uranium and thorium, and they have uh, very long half lives ranging from 710 million years, uh, four and a half billion, so about the age of, um, of the planet, of Earth, uh, and 14 and a half billion years, about the age of the universe. So. Um, as a result of this, it's quite a unique situation um, for, isotope, for isotope systems. It means that there's a lot of variability, uh, natural variability in, um, in, in lead sources, depending on the uranium thorium lead ratios um, and how um, sources of lead kind of evolve through geological time. It means there's quite a lot of scope to introduce isotopic variation, which can be used to as a signature and a fingerprint to um, identify um, uh, lead sources. So with these four isotopes, uh, you essentially can um, you essentially can have six up to six ratios. Um, so um, I was just going to talk quickly now about how we actually get um, isotope data using quadrupole ICPMS. So quadrupole ICPMS is not typical to get isotope ratio data. But um, because of the large variability in um, relative abundances of the lead isotopes, it is possible. Um, so I'll give a quick mention to the this Osman paper. So this was a um, paper from 2018 in collaboration with the University of Nottingham, um, British Geological Survey, and uh, Fermo, uh, Fermo Scientific. And they basically optimized conditions um, for isotope ratio analysis using quadrupole ICPMS, uh, specifically a, a Fermo ICAP2 ICPMS instrument, which is the same instrument that we have in our, lab, in our labs. Um, and so um, we were largely able just to take 
uh, their methods here. They did all the hard work for us in the method development, um, essentially, and we, we could just use what, what they developed here. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's a few more considerations when you want to do isotope analysis uh, as compared to, um, as you might with uh, just standard concentration analysis. So what we monitored is we monitored the, the four lead isotopes, so 204, 206, 207, and 208. 204 lead has a uh, isobaric interference of 204 mercury. And so we monitored 200 mercury in order to perform um, a correction on that. And we also included um, uh, thallium and um, thallium and monitored 203, 205 thallium uh, to use for a mass bias correction. Um, so we used floor times of 10 milliseconds. We performed, performed 1,000 scans per run and six runs. So this means that analysis time for a sample is on the order of six, six to seven minutes, so a lot longer than you would analyze for a concentration analysis. Um, so ideally, um, when you do um, isotope analysis, you only want to be monitoring your signals uh, using one detector mode. So in quadrupole ICPMS, when you've got low levels of signal, you do it essentially in a pulse mode. And when it gets to a certain threshold, uh, it switches to an analog mode. And if you do that, um, why you want to use the data, when you want to use the data for isotope ratios, you'll end up uh, producing highly imprecise isotope ratios because you're using different detector modes. So what we found was that um, a concentration of seven micrograms per litre of lead was um, kind of the sweet spot because um, we, we had sufficient, um, the, the major isotope of 208 lead was below the threshold to switch to analog mode, but we still had a sufficient signal on the minor isotope 204 uh, to get um, uh, sufficient counting statistics and monitor the 204 isotope. And then we added um, five micrograms per litre of, of thallium uh, again, that would just sat nicely in the in the pulse counting mode um, and provided good counting statistics. Um, but it's also important that we um, did the detected dead time um, correction at the start of each measurement session. So essentially, if you set the detected dead time uh, to zero and nanoseconds, and you increase the concentration of of lead, uh, what you find is that this has an impact on the lead isotope ratio. So using this equation, you can calculate the uh, correct dead time factor to use for your, uh, for your detector, and then you should see no effect on the isotope ratio with concentration of lead. And this was typically um, in the range of 36 to 42 nanoseconds for, um, for our measurement sessions. We then used uh, the thallium to, um, to, for mass bias correction. So in ICPMS, you get essentially uh, you have a slight bias to uh, the transmission of heavier isotopes or the lighter isotopes uh, to the detector. So this will bias your measured ratio. So by um, using this internal standard, we have the measured value and the reference value, and we know the mass difference uh, between the isotopes, and we can calculate this mass bias correction factor, which we can then apply to our other, um, um, other isotope ratios, which are of a similar sim mass range, um, and get our mass bias um, collected isotope ratios. Um, so we then used uh, the, uh, the mass bias corrected ratios in order to correct for the 204, any 204 mercury isobaric interference, uh, which was typically very small anyway. But uh, this uses basically the 200 mercury mass bias corrected ratio and the 204 200 mercury reference value uh, to, to essentially get to your 204 lead. Uh, mass bias corrected ratio. Um, then to get from your mass bias corrected ratio to a true ratio, so uh, in order to be able to compare ratios between measurement sessions, but also between labs, so we could compare between uh, our uh, results in a PHE with the labs at BHS, BGS, um, you basically uh, bracket your uh, samples with a, a NIST 981 lead standard. Um, and then use uh, just a linear regression to uh, find the deviation from of the mass bias corrected ratio to the true ratio, and then you can apply that correction to your uh, to your samples to go from the mass bias corrected ratio to your true ratio. Um, so that's all I'm going to talk about. about the, that's all the equations done. <laughs> well, that wasn't too many equations, uh, so we can go on and talk about some of the uh, actual results now. So. 
Um, this is a, basically summarizes all the uh, lead isotope ratio results we had from all the samples uh, that had sufficient lead in them to measure the isotope ratio. We can see that most of them cluster in this box. So this is probably um, representing the kind of more local regional lead isotope composition of Georgia. And these uh, samples are plot outside of this. Uh, so we have some paint, a tea sample, and some spices. Uh, these are probably um, uh, exotic samples, maybe imported from further afield. Uh, and so they show um, lead isotope compositions that are uh, uh, significantly different from, from uh, the main plot in the middle here. So if we um, zoom in to that area of interest, so uh, this is all the data. It's, it's a bit um, messy. So I chose to plot the 207 lead over 206 lead and do the weight over 206 lead here. And it just gave the, it, it uh, showed the best separation. Um, um, and um, so this is a free isotope plot. So I'm just going to introduce uh, these samples one at a time to make it a bit clearer. So here's um, our blood data. So um, that all kind of clusters around this area. What we found was that the best, often the best matches for, um, for the blood, most similar came from some of the spices, um, but also our household dust showed um, quite a good overlap with some of the blood as well. Um, soils tended to plot lower down in this region. Uh, and then uh, paints, we saw a distribution across uh, this false kind of range, uh, not particularly looking uh, so similar to, to the blood. Um, teas, again, put a bit higher on 207 to a six ratio. Um, and then water, again, just, just they seem to cluster up here. And then the toys, milk and flower samples didn't, uh, the, we were quite limited in the number of samples we could measure for lead isotope ratio composition, and they didn't add um, that much um, to the story there. So that's that's kind of looking at the results as on a national kind of scale. But what we can also do is look at them at more of a, a single household or an individual um, point of view. Um, so I just picked out three examples here. So the um, the first example up here. Uh, this was actually the, the had the spice sample with the with the highest lead total concentration, um, and it had um, this. Um, this is actually uh, one of the Georgian spice mixes, um, and uh, it had a second spice actually that had quite a high lead concentration. And what we saw actually was that um, the lead isotope composition for these two spices was isotopically indistinct from, from the from the lead in the blood. So maybe a good indication. That the lead in the blood is is uh, potentially coming from uh, one or both of these spices. Um, but if we look at uh, another household here, slightly low lead blood. Again, just all these lead blood levels were actually below the action level, so which is a good thing. Um, this this sample also had um, a spice sample with a very high um, lead uh, concentration that plotted up here. But that's distinct from the from the blood down here. This 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 uh, this individual had a blood lead that was isotopically indistinct from one of the uh, the dust sample, the household dust, um, but also um, a couple of other spices. Uh, one of which was uh, had a uh, slightly uh, quite an elevated lead uh, concentration. Um, and then um, th there was uh, this sample. Uh, this participant also um, had quite a good match for one of the spice samples also, but wasn't particularly high, uh, but also has a good match for the um, for the household dust. Um, so seeing some good um, isotope matches for the uh, household dust and spice, um, potentially indicating that these um, may be the main contributions to lead in the blood. Uh, so um thinking about where we're going from here so uh, what we need to do is um do more data analysis and modeling and uh, so the data is now with um some uh, statisticians phd statisticians that we're collaborating, collaborating with and epidemiologists and the idea is to look at the association of lead isotope compositions um, at the national and household level uh, but linking all the concentration the ratio data and 
the information from the questionnaire together into one cohesive kind of picture. Um, these findings um, are being fed back to the participants um, to help uh, kind of keep them informed, but also reduce and keep exposures low. Um, and essentially, uh, the, we've, we've seen that um, the participants in these surveys have had a really positive um, outcome from just from the intervention of a letter of raising awareness and educating. Um, but the children, there's, there's probably, probably quite a high incidence of children and probably adults who are not really, have not really been looked at in any detail outside of this study um, who would benefit from some kind of um, intervention. And so hopefully um, with the additional information gained here, uh, that will inform the Georgian Centre for Disease Control to put in place some intervention uh, that will help a uh, uh, population level. Um, so with that, I'd just like to say thank you and quickly mention my collaborators again, so the Georgian Centre for Disease Control, uh, the BGS, um, and my collaborators in Public Health England as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, we just, I'm just conscious of the time. Thank you for your talk. We'll come back with questions at the end um, and we'll move on to our um, final speaker this afternoon. Um, and this is um, Dr. Elizabeth Lees um, from the UK's Health and Safety Executives Science and Research Centre. Liz has worked in the biological monitoring team at HSE for over 15 years. Her work, um, she's also an analytical chemist and her work is focused on speciation analysis and couple techniques with ICPMS in relation to biological monitoring. Her projects include um, arsenic, um, her current research projects include arsenic speciation and more recently chromium speciation and silica single particle analysis in XL breath condensate. So we'll just um, change presenters and Liz will start her talk. Okay, Liz, everything's good to go. Is it, is it as it should be? Okay. Yes, yes it is. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the HBM4EU chromate study, uh, which is a European human biomonitoring project to determine occupational exposure to chromium-6 uh, across Europe. So, I'm not working. There we go. So the HBM4EU project as a whole is quite a large study. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly talk about the aims and then specifically the chromate study, the countries involved, the study group and the samples that we've collected. Then a quick overview of the summary of the results from the wider chromate study. But then towards the end, we, I'm just going to focus on XL breath condensate. Um, so I'm going to tell you about what it is the speciation analysis, and then an overview of the XL breath condensate speciation results that we've got so far. Okay, so the HBM4 EU program consists of experts from over 30 European countries, and their aims are to improve chemical risk management and provide support for policy making and risk assessment. And they are going to do that by understanding human exposure and related health risks to chemicals, either in the environment, by occupational uh, settings, or by the use of consumer products. So the work strand that we're involved in is investigating workers' exposure to hazardous chemicals in the workplace. Uh, one of the important focuses of the HBM4U project is to harmonise methodologies and standardised approaches to data collection to enable the comparisons and the findings of the results across all the different European um, countries. So the HBM4EU programme identified chemicals of concern, of which hexavalent chromium was one of them, 
some of the other studies um, have been flame retardants and phthalates and, and bisphenols. Um, and the secondary study that we're all just about to start now have included chemicals such as acrylamides and disocyanates, mercury-related pesticides. So just to give you a range of the different things that everybody's looking at. So the main concern for hexavalent chromium is are the current safety and control measures used in workplaces across Europe sufficient to protect the workers? And the three industries that were identified were chrome platers, stainless steel welders, and surface treatment workers, such as painting and spraying. So when it comes to biomonitoring of hexavalent chromium for occupational exposure, the most common used approach is um, by a urine sample, uh, which analyzes total chromium content. So it's not specific for chromium-6 exposure because you can't distinguish between chromium-3 and chromium-6 in a urine sample because generally all bodily fluids tend to uh, convert all hexavalent chromium down to trivalent chromium. And it's thought that as exposures are reduced due to increased demands from regulators, that there might be a point where urinary total chromium methods are less useful because it's going to be really difficult to distinguish between the dietary aspect and um, the dietary contribution from trivalent um, chromium and the occupational hexavalent chromium. So the program understood that there was also a need to investigate and develop alternative biomarkers for chromium-6 exposure. So two of those potential biomarkers was chromium in red blood cells and XL breath. So chromium in red blood cells, it reflects exposure to chromium-6 only because only chromium-6 can penetrate the cell membrane. And it's stable in a red blood cell for the lifetime of that cell, which is roughly around 120 days. Then when it comes to XL breath condensate, it provides a more specific information for an inhalation exposure. It's a lot less invasive than collecting a blood sample. And you can measure and separate chromium-6 and chromium-3 in the same sample um, before, before it's all completely reduced to chromium-3. So in the chromate study, these are the different countries that were involved in the chromate study as a whole but not everybody collected every type of um, sample matrix. So for instance, uh, in the UK, we didn't collect blood samples um, and Poland and Luxembourg, they didn't collect um, XL bed samples. So we started um, a site visit to the three um, target industries. And at the start of the working week on the Monday morning, um, before the workers started work, we went and collected a pre-urine sample and XL breath sample. Then on the Thursday, we went back and took a post-urine sample and XL breath sample at the end of the day. And then for the full working shift, um, industrial hygiene samples were taken. So um, the workers wore personal air samplers and hand wipes were taken at the beginning of the shift before they went for lunch, after lunch, and then at the end of the day. Um, blood samples were taken for red blood cells and plasma, and then contextual information was gathered by um, a questionnaire. So this is just um, showing the distribution of the different workers. So 602 workers were sampled altogether. 203 of those um, formed the comparison control group. Then you can see we've got 112 crown plating workers, 92 surface treatment workers and 195 stainless steel welders. So this is uh, just a table showing some general urine results. Um, let's see, so if you can see that the crown platers had the highest chromium exposure in their urine samples. with the surface treatment and the welders not being that dissimilar. But all exposed workers showed increased levels of urinary chromium when compared to the controls. 
Um, and surface treatment, in general, they had the lowest. For geometric means, the medians and the uh, 95th percentiles for all workers showed an increase of chromium-6 from pre to post working week. So this is a table showing the general chromium in red blood cell results. So the surface treatment workers and the chrome platers had significantly higher red blood cells um, than the control group. The welders didn't seem to have elevated results. In fact, if you look at their geometric mean, the median, they're both lower, lower than the controls. And if we look at some facts from the air filters and the hand wipes, so all three uh, target activities showed an increase in workers' dermal chromium contamination during the working shift with the welders having the highest hand white chromium levels and the surface treatment having the lowest. Then when it came to the air monitoring, um, the surface treatment workers had the highest chromium-6 air levels, but they um, were most likely to wear RPE, which is probably why their urine levels um, were the lowest. And the platers had the lowest chromium-6 air levels and they were the least likeliest to wear any form of RPE, um, which is probably why their urine levels were the highest and their blood levels. So if we move on and talk about XL breath. So XL breath is a biological fluid. Um, it's cooled exhaled air as a condensate solution. And it consists of mostly water vapour. In fact, over 99% of the collected condensate is water vapour. But within that, you will find droplets of airway lining fluid that come from the respiratory tract. And within those droplets of lining fluid, you'll find an unknown, excuse me, an unknown fraction of volatile water-soluble compounds, such as ammonia or ethanol but also non-volatile substances such as lipids, proteins and salts, and then environmental and occupational contaminants. So exhale breath condensate is collected and there's several commercial devices, but this one that you can see here is the TurboDex. And exhale breath is collected through regular tidal breathing through a disposable mouthpiece. It's not a forced breath. It takes 10 to 15 minutes to collect approximately one mil. The, the volume that you collect is very individual. Some people will produce a lot more exhale breath than others. It's non-invasive and it does not cause an inflammatory response itself. So if you've got any workers that have asthma um, or anything like that, it's completely fine and safe for them to give an exhale breath sample. So one of the problems when it comes to speciating chromium is the interconversion between the two oxidation states um, and the stability and the integrity of these species uh, can be a challenge during sample collection and during analysis and sample storage. So the TurboDex machines were taken to site and the workers produced a sample over 15 minutes and immediately after they produced that sample, um, an aliquot of the breath was diluted tenfold with 0.5 millimolar of EDTA, which was adjusted to pH 8. And the samples were stored refrigerated. Uh, they must not be frozen. So there's two published papers there that shows um, the development of this method of collection and stabilizing um, and a feasibility study looking to see if um, chromium could be measured in real workers. So the speciation analysis, so by the end, only five countries had collected exhaled breath condensate samples. Two of the countries have had to withdraw their um, results due to problems with either contamination or building works happening across the road and it disrupting the ICPMSs. And there you can see that um, Finland and France analysed their samples using liquid chromatography ICP. Italy were using iron chromatography, 
and then myself here was analysing samples by micro LC. Now five countries, the Netherlands also collected samples, um, but they didn't have a chromium speciation technique at their laboratory, so their samples were sent here to the UK and I analysed those. You can also see the limits of quantification uh, from each country and their different um, chromium speciation methods. Um, everybody used an anion exchange column. So this is um, how the micro LC system that we use here at HSE. Um, so it just it's a ESI one fast system that fits just nicely on the side of the ICP. And if I show you a little bit more closely, you can see it works um, by a switching valve with a sample loop, and then a small it's a five centimeter long um, iron an iron exchange column. And then, yeah, so it's a Dianex AG7 column. It uses an isocratic mobile phase of a ammonia and nitric acid mix um, adjusted to pH between 1.8 and 2. The sample loop that you just saw was 500 microliters. The flow rate is a mill a minute and the acquisition time is 230 seconds. So as the samples out on site had been diluted tenfold with 0.5 millimolar of EDTA, um, so everything else, was, so the QCs and the calibration standards uh, were treated exactly the same. So you can just see a, a chromatogram there of the two separated species. So the EDTA um, complexes with chromium-3 to keep that stable and the pH adjustment to pH-8 stabilizes uh, chromium-6. So I'm not sorry for this next table. So this is just the um, chromium-6 and chromium-3 in XL breath samples split into the three different target activities. So you can see that the platers had the highest chromium-6 results, which match the same as what was observed for urine and blood samples. Um, surface treatment had the lowest. You could see that in the pre-working wheat samples, 100% of those XL breath samples were all less than the limit of quantification. And it wasn't that much better for the post-working wheat samples or the chromium-3 in EBC for pre and post. Then the welders came somewhere in the middle. So you can see that the the amount of samples less than the LOQ in the welders was quite high for chromium-6, but then it was really quite low for chromium-3. Uh, whereas you can see for the platers that the amount of samples less than the LOQ was reasonably stable across both chrome-6 and chrome-3 for both pre and post. So the following plot just makes it a little bit easier to look at this data. So you can, you, you can see that we've got out with company controls and within company controls. And that is because we found out that afterwards some countries had collected controls from within the target activity companies. So the people that worked in the offices, the administra administrative staff, and then other countries had collected controls from companies that had nothing to do with chromium. So for instance, in the UK, we went to um, a quarry and collected XLB samples from stonemasons to, to try and match the, the group. They were both manual workers, predominant gender, male, the same. So you can see from the Chromium 3 results that the out with company controls, which were taken from companies that had nothing to do with Chromium, showed 100% of chromium-3 less than the LOQ. But when it came to the administrative workers that were taken from within the target companies, that only 34% of their chromium-3 EBC results were less than the LOQ. In fact, they're higher than the surface treatment workers and they look extremely similar to the welders and the platers. Now, looking at the data, the majority of the within company controls were from plating companies. 
showing that there's quite high bystander exposure. So if we look at chromium-6, there's a similar situation with the outwit company controls and from the within company controls. You can easily see from this plot that the platers have got the highest results. In fact, even their pre-working week is higher than the post-working week results from welders and surface treatment workers. So if we just have a, a look at the summary of EBC findings. So there were statistical significant differences between the control groups, between the two different control groups um, that shows that in future multi-center studies like this, that controls have to really be controls and have no real, um, no real contact with with the chemical that you're trying to measure, whether they're in administrative roles or working with the chemical itself. And there was also a statistical significant difference between the pre and post EBC samples for chromium-6. One of the great things about the EBC results was that they agreed with both blood and urine that the platers had the highest exposure um, showing that there is a future for measuring chromium-6 in XL breath condensate. And it also showed the same agreement with each country. So when the XL breath samples were split up from Finland and Italy and France, each country also showed that the platers had the highest exposure. So the surface treatment workers had the lowest chromium-6 and chromium-3 results. Uh, with very high numbers, um, less than the LOQ. Um, as I just said, the platers pre-chromium-6 EBC levels were higher than the post of the other two target activities. Welders had the higher chromium-3 levels, um, higher than platers, which uh, seemed a little unusual considering the, um, how elevated the chromium-6 levels were in chrome platers. And so one of the things that we're thinking about is that the differences in XL breath condensate chromium species in welders and platers may reflect the exposure to the different compounds of chromium-6. So for a plater, they'll be exposed to the highly soluble chromium-6 mists and vapors within the plating tanks, which most likely lead to an increased uptake, whereas the welders are exposed to a lot a low soluble metallic chromium, which is oxidized in the high temperatures to a chromium-6 fume, which would lead to a lower uptake. But the fact that the chromium-3 levels were so high might represent the increased body burden um, of the excretion that the welders are finding as opposed to the platers with the higher soluble chromium, that the, in, that the uptake is high, but the excretion is fast and high as well. So I just want to acknowledge the different countries that took part in the Chromate study, and the different institutions and all the different um, people from the analysts to the hygienists, um, and also um, to people that helped with the project overall, such as setting up um, an external quality assurance scheme for all the labs to participate in to make sure that their analytical methods were up to scratch. And then I'd like to thank everybody um, for listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Liz, uh, for a really lovely talk. Um, I'm gonna bring everybody back with everybody on camera. Um, I'm gonna change the screen. Okay. Now let's see if we can get everybody talking okay i have got some questions i realize we're almost at we're already at time so i'll try and keep them um focused and brief we've got for robert we've got um some questions at, uh, looking at around the tungsten exposures in um fallon uh, there's two questions uh, so was the cancer cluster related to the particular chemical in fallon and um 
the second question was what kind of reaction did you get from the population as you could um, not state what the health effects maybe were for tungsten and especially as you could not state what the health effects might have been for tungsten so um let me answer the second question first um because i need you to repeat the first question so the reaction from the community was disappointment that we couldn't tell the community what a health effect was from tungsten but unfortunately uh, that was just due to the fact that there was no literature that had done no one had done any studies looking at tungsten probably because of the billions of light bulbs and other things that tungsten was used for there was no occupational um you know occupational exposures that resulted in uh, some sort of medical problems um now when then we passed it on to the national toxicology program so um that's still in the works um and we have updated the community somewhat since then so what was the first question again? The first question was, was the cancer cluster related to a particular chemical in the end, or was it tungsten or was it something else? So the genetics testing found something. Unfortunately, it was not statistically relevant. The problem is you only had 16 cases and um, about 40, no, a few more controls. So unfortunately, statistically, you can't say that it was tungsten um, and had a genetic link, but um, it pointed to that. So that was disappointing that we didn't have a statistically relevant result. And is that community followed through now? Do you still look at those people or? So we have not been asked to go back and look at that community since then, because again, uh, the cancer cluster dropped off. So there's not been an abnormal amount of these types of cancers in that community. Again, we still have not figured out what caused the cancer cluster to start up, be such at a high level, and then drop off again. There's several theories, but no one's really sure. Um, but if the community requests us to come back, we probably would come back and do a study again to see if there's any any relevance. But again, remember the the water systems um were were worked so that they have a new water purification system that extracts the arsenic and tungsten out and people on private wells we gave them a lot of advice on the water purification systems that they can use in private wells to protect themselves against these uh, arsenic and tungsten in their drinking water in their homes okay thank you i've got there's also a question for adam um, thank you, Adam. Nice talk. I'm curious to know if the ratios using 204 lead as the denominator showed any trends or benefits compared with using 206. Yeah, so the reason I chose uh, not to include 204 is that there, there was less of a distinction between the samples. Um, also, with it being the minor isotope, you have a slightly larger uncertainty, analytical uncertainty, um, so your error bars are slightly larger. So um, the best distinction that I I found by uh, kind of eyeballing the data, because <laughs> um, as I mentioned, the data with the statisticians at PHE were going to do a bit more rigorous testing with this, uh, but the clearest uh, trends were seen with the with the ratios I showed: 207, 206, 208, 206. 206. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I've got a final question. Um, Liz, it looks like you escaped the questions. Um, it's for Robert again. Um, does the FDA monitor contaminants in foods such as chicken and fish? And if yes, did they see a signal for arsenic in chickens for human consumption? The FDA monitors quite a number of different contaminants in food. Um, it's called the Market Basket Survey. So they collect samples from across the United States and constantly monitor for different organic and inorganic um, um, contaminants in food. So definitely in fish, in chicken, and many other products um, across the United States, the FDA does monitor. They also monitor imports. Um, so you know juices and fruits and things like that. Uh, processed foods coming into this country they also monitor those as well so it's kind of related and it's a personal question do you have a source of roxo arsenone that you um 
acquire for analysis in your laboratory? You said rock star stone? Yeah, we seem to be unable to order it here. Um, we haven't analyzed rock star stone in quite some number of years. Um, so I'd have to go back and check. If you'll just email me the question. I will. Um, Thank you. I'll check my uh, staff to see if they have a source. OK, we've got two late questions coming in and then we'll wrap it up. So a question for Adam. Is the high concentration in spices due to adulteration? <laughs> yeah, I wonder if I was going to be asked. Um, so the, um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, we haven't done any of the tests. So isotopically, uh, we didn't see any distinction in the leads with high concentrations to those with low concentrations. So if they are being adulterated, with some other source of lead, it has a very similar isotope composition to the lead that's in the unadulterated spices. Um, but we'd have to run some further tests to actually confirm whether it's that or not. The other theory is that in the spice mixers, uh, there are um, basically, um, well, there's a lot of walnuts in there, and they're known to hyperaccumulate heavy metals because they accumulate at that level. Um, and saffron also is known as a hyperaccumulator of heavy metals as well. So, yeah, it's, um, I don't know is the answer. <laughs> okay, okay, because there's another question about whether um, the lead is due to where the spices are grown. But I guess if you don't know, then that's yeah. Uh, that's... Sorry, Li sorry, it's okay, Liz. I lied. There's one question snuck in. Um, did you control for orthopedic implants to urine concentration? Uh, yes, we did. That was collected in the contextual data, so any type of um, surgery for a broken leg or implants that were still remaining from a hip replacement or a knee replacement, they were all collected, yes. And have, has that data been analysed yet, or is that something to come? It's something that the, they're, they're still looking at, the contextual data specifically for urine and blood is still, still being looked at. Okay. All right. Um, so that brings us to the end of today's session. I'd like to thank our three speakers, Liz, Robert and Adam. Um, thank you so much for giving your time to prepare the presentation to give it today. Um, I'm really sorry for the sound issues at the start of the session. Um, and I'd like to invite you all to join us on the 22nd of June when the next session will be C is for um, chromatography. And that will be at three o'clock in the afternoon. And you can find the links um, in the same place as you did before. Um, I will try and share my screen to show, let's see if I can finish by shutting everything down and fi finishing it where you can find um, the information and with my email address. So once again, guys, thank you very much. Um, and I will try and share my screen so that we can, okay. So the next one is a CS for chromatography. These will be the guys that will be speaking then. We will have um, Roberto from Oviedo, Christian from LGC, Nancy from Belgium, and Elliot from the British Geological Survey talking about different types of chromatography coupled with ICPMS. And if you have any um, issues or questions or would like to register for that, you can directly email me and this is my email address. Um, thank you all for today and thank you for attending.